2 Samuel chapter number 5, if you will. I want to read uh, some verses from this chapter and then come back and look um, at uh, what takes place in its, uh, in its content. First, 2 Samuel chapter number 5. We read, verse 4, that David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven and a half years, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites and the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except you take away the blind and the lame, you shall not come in here, thinking David cannot come in there, this impenetrable walled city of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever gets up in the gutter and smites the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are, and the halted of David's soul, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. And David perceived the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Verse number 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, and all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and he went down to the hold. And the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perizim, and David smote them there and said, The Lord has broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of the place Baal Perizim. And there they left their images, their gods, their idols, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, he says, You sh inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall bestir yourself, you shall, then shall the Lord go out before you to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba unto Gazir. May God bless the reading of His Word. I want to share with you tonight as we've been looking through real faith, the real life, real faith, the life of David, looking at one man, the Bible traces all these different scenarios in his life and shows us what, what does faith look like in a true man of God's life. We know what it looks like in the flippant or the carnal or the godless, but what does it look like in a real man of faith's life? And we begin to see already some of the ups and downs in David's life, and we're going to see that. But what we're looking at is the real authentic article of faith and how that looks out, fleshed out in everyday life. To, to, this evening, as we look at chapter number five, you see David is anointed king. Finally, he's been anointed in earlier chapters over the king of Judah, ruled seven and a half years. Now, uh, uh, Abner's dead, Ishbosh is dead, Saul's dead, and now all the tribes have come to David to come into agreement with him and anoint him king over all the tribes of Israel. So what had become divided, now David is bringing back together in the unity of the full kingdom. As he does so, no more did he put the crown upon his head till the battles began. And that's what we see throughout this chapter. You're going to see it peppered throughout the rest of David's life. But here we find three occasions just in one short chapter where David enters into warfare. And you just kind of see this as a trend for David's life. And so I want to share with you tonight on the subject matter of fighting the never-ending battles. For David, as soon as he would get through one battle, it seems like he had another one to face. He would deal with this front and uh, get that kind of halfway dealt with, and he would have to turn and fight on another front. Or the return, the enemy, after being defeated, would come back again. And so he's dealing with some of the same things over and over in his life. And so his life became one, this man of faith, his life became one of real warfare. 
real warfare, real hand-to-hand combat, real swords, real shields, real arrows, real wounds, real death. Now, while all of us have not had that kind of physical warfare, we do know that the Scripture tells us as we walk in our faith, there is a warfare we must deal with. You can't hide from it. It's coming. It's going to find you. There's no hole you can dig. There's no isolated place you can keep. Spiritual warfare is a real deal. If you crown Christ Lord of your life, you can count on it. The war is coming to your doorstep. And guess what? It don't ever leave. What we come to learn from this book and from the New Testament in our own life is that the Christian life is a warfare. It is a constant that goes on. And when we, just like David, when he's turning from one uh, battle to another, you and I, sometimes it seems like when it's raining and it's pouring, it just seems like the battle is all over us. And then, but even in the times of peace and some times of reprieve, we're always, seems like we're gearing up for that next battle that's around the next corner. Sometimes in our mind, we get frustrated. We just kind of want to say, why can't everybody just get along? Why can't this thing just be smooth? Why does there always have to be war? The reality is it's just a fact of life. A fact we do well to teach our own children that they're going to have some difficulties and struggles in life. And for every Christian at least, we need to magnify the fact that, man, you may have the power of God in your life, but that power is there for a reason. That power is there to get you through this war that we've got to walk through. And so what we're finding is our lifelong posture as a Christian is one for warfare. It is part of our faith. It is the faith that leads us into battles unforeseen before we were Christians. And so now we're all going along. And again, even the times where we're kind of at rest, sometimes maybe you're here tonight and you've been through some battles, but you're kind of breathing a little easy because the kitchen's not so hot right now. But we all know, my friend, you better get your army prepared. You better make preparations because even in this nation, if we let down our military preparedness, all it's going to take, my friend, is one inopportune time for this nation. It could be leveled if we're not always ready for any type of enemy that could come. Same with our life. And so as we go through life, we got to be prepared. Uh, You can't wait till the battle starts to start getting trained and getting ready. We need to be as ready as Abraham, who, when he went to fight the the kings who had come and taken Lot and those other kings, it says he took those from his own home, his own family. They were already trained, ready for battle. And we're to stay battle ready for those things that are going to confront our life. In fact, I was thinking today, you know, when your children get a little bit older and so forth, you kind of put some things in the wind till your grandchildren start coming along and then you start, hey, we got to make sure we're planning along the way because these kids got brains like sponges and they absorb everything. You got to make sure you're getting in the good stuff as long as, as well as the stuff that really don't amount to a hill of beans. But I was thinking kind of the emphasis we have a lot of times as parents and grandparents and kind of as a society is we want kids to have fun. And we want to try to, we want to spend money and we want to have uh, as many opportunities at where we can teach kids to play. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love to see kids play. I like to crawl on the floor with them, get down there and play with them. But I do think, my friend, there's something to be said about maybe backing off some of the emphasis of trying to make sure our children know how to play and make sure our children know how to fight. Because, see, they're going out into the world that's coming after them. You, you, there's whole societies, there's billions of dollars poured into all kinds of mechanisms that are going to come for your children's heart and soul and mind. They're coming after them. And they're going to fight, they're going to face things at school and they're going to face things in their life. A whole array of battles on a whole lot of fronts. The best thing we can do is get an early start and already teach them, not trying to avoid every difficulty they're going to go through, but already train them. When you go through these difficulties, start putting some arrows and some swords and some shields at their disposal and teach them how to fight. We look at this warfare that pervades throughout this chapter and we learn some ways that David faces and maybe tonight they can be instructive to us. The first thing that stands out in this story as we begin to read it is the introduction to war in verse 4 through 6 as the Bible is sitting here telling us that all the people come together and crown David as king. Now what you find in the book of Samuel and Kings, you find another... um, 
uh, another writing and advantage point in the book of Chronicles. Well, what you read in Chronicles about this event in 1 Chronicles chapter number 12, it says all these people gathered together, all the men and all the army <coughs> and all of Israel gathered together to make David king over all of Israel. They gathered together, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12, 38 through 40, as one heart. And they were there, the Bible says, three days eating and drinking and celebrating, it says. And here was the statement, for there was joy in Israel. Man, we ain't got this ridiculous, pathetic excuse for a king named Saul who all he ever did was bring devastation and division. No, now we got us a king, the tribes are together, three-day party of celebrating. There's David, there's God's man. He's the one Samuel anointed. That's the one we've seen leading us anyway. And they celebrate for three days, and man, there's a joy all through the nation. And then comes the battle. See, this seems to be almost kind of the experience that we have in our own Christian life. I, I knew the way of the transgressor's heart. I knew what it was to struggle in life, but I had no idea about the severity of spiritual battles until Christ became my king. Had no idea. I thought, man alive, you come into Christ and I'm looking forward to some of that peace and forgiveness and joy that God brings. And man, He does that. But I, I, I recognized very quickly, very early on in the Christian life that there were some battles that I'd never had to deal with in times past that instantaneously, now that Jesus is Lord of my life, now the battle is on. If the enemy could not keep me blinded, if he could not keep me uh, it's safeguard, uh, allured, and entertained with everything in this world. The one thing he wants to do is keep you to becoming too much of a fanatic. And my friend, that's all I want to be. I want to be a fanatic. I want to be a fanatic moment. I, I want all in with Christ. I knew nothing uh, in early Christianity as some kind of half-baked, go to church on Sunday and just be whatever you're else, uh, uh, your own, living your own life. And I never knew any Christianity like that. I knew God came into my life, changed me, filled me with His love and power. And so the war comes. And this is why we're taught in the Scriptures that, that we're called to warfare. That word is used describing our going-going Christian existence. To war a good warfare. To be, as Paul called us, good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Or as he reminds us, to fight the good fight of faith. My friend, it's a fight, but God reminds us it's a good fight. Nothing, you're gonna, nothing that's going to come to you, no struggle mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually will come your way. Ultimately, you fight that because it's a good fight. There's a good end. There's a good purpose. There's a good result. Men go and lay their lives on the line all, every single day in our, in our military. Why? Because they believe they're serving something bigger than themselves, more important than themselves. And my day, the gospel is that to us. The king on his throne, to travel through this world and in a very short amount of time be in the very presence of God. We need to be ready to fight. And I'm telling you what, that's what real faith is. Real faith is a fight. It cannot be any other way. If there's no fight, if there's no battle, if there's no struggle, there is no faith. Because that's why faith exists. Is to move me counter culture, counter world, counter carnality, ca counter human heart and instinct. And my friend, the devil may give up at times, but it ain't going to be easy. And your flesh ain't never going to leave you alone. So there's introductions to the war, and then there's the intimidation in the war. David's first step was to go to where God had promised in the Old Testament. God said, I'm going to choose a place to put my name. He didn't tell him where it was. He said, I'm going to put my name in a specific place, and that's going to be my place. It's going to be the place where you gather, meet with me, I speak through. It's going to be that particular place will be my special place. Well, David is now not just not this uh, awkward man-made king from Benjamin. Now David is the rightful king through the right tribe. David is on the throne, and David knows, let's go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it was a city kind of mainly unclaimed. When you read the book of Joshua and Judges, when they're divvying out the proportions, jo jo uh, Jerusalem was one of those cities where it said Judah went and, and, and won a war, but they could never run out the Jebusites. 
And so there they are. They're living right there in the center of Palestine. These Jebusites still own Jerusalem. And David knows that's going to be God's city. And so David marches up to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a dynamic place. It's the center of the world for a reason. It's the center of so many battles for a reason. It's the chief, this chief city that uh, so many religious and political and commercial uh, people adore and they want. And it's an impenetrable place surrounded by three particular valleys. It sits like a diamond on the, on the crest of a ring. It sits there, high walls. And so their Jerusalem was there and Jerusalem and the Jebusites felt because of the fortitude of the city, it was impenetrable. And so David comes up and they see powerful King David and they look down and mock David. They said, I tell you what, we all we got is lame and blind people, but y'all can whip our blind and lame people, you can come up. It says, because in verse number 6, it says, because they didn't think David could take the city. And so they're mocking him and they're using this ridiculous... It angered David. Verse number 8, it actually made David, ticked him off. And David said, who's going to go up there and take this city from me? And we're going to take care of it. They said, all they got watching is lame and blind. Who's going to go take this city? He said, it made David angry. And so in the midst of this, you have this intimidation. And by the way, a lesser man would have walked home. A lesser man would have seen this great, fantastic, walled city in such a place that seems it is impenetrable. And you hear the words of these mockers who sent many people home because they didn't realize, didn't think they could, it was a waste of their time to even give it a shot. Lesser men would have walked just because of the intimidation. But David, he ain't a lesser man. See, David's a man who lives by purpose. He doesn't live by ambition. David's listen, living by the rule of God, not the rule of just desire for covetousness and gain. And so David realizes this ain't the first roaring line he's heard before. I mean, we hear, if just these Jebusites, we could pull them aside, you're like, hey guys, you, you might want to back up that a little bit. You may want to roll those words because we were down in the valley when there was a giant and over nine feet tall running his mouth too. Talking about how he was going to treat David like a little dog. He's going to kill David. I, I'd be careful of my words. But it's amazing as God tells us that the enemy's like a roaring lion. I, I think he informs us that because the roar gets most people. The enemy don't ever even have to take a bite out of us. All he's got to do is roar. And most guys say, yeah, I'm too tired. I don't want to fight. I heard a pastor come to the pastor's conference not too many years ago. We were talking about a hot topic issue at the association meeting. And this pastor from Sparta just says, yeah, I don't want to fight no more. You know why I tell you you ought to get out of the ministry then? Because ministry is a fight. And the Christian life's a fight. And I think there's too many people they don't want to fight. They're just tired of fighting. That they don't want to deal with the, the, the politics of the day that have to do with real, solid, moral issues because we're just tired. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to get our hands are dirty. But I want to tell you what, my friend, that ain't faith. And so here, David, they're saying, yeah, yeah David, David, you can't come up here. And all I'm going to tell you what, David been heard that many, many times. His brothers told him he couldn't do it. His daddy didn't think he could do it. Even King Saul says, boy, you're too young. You can't do it. You are not able. I love those commercials when you find a professional athlete, right, that's kind of doesn't fit the form of a professional athlete. They've been told they can't do it their whole life, and then they become great in their profession, and then all they do, they make these commercials where they're showing all that and say, yeah, everybody said I couldn't do it, but, and then I got all these championships, so I just want to say to all you naysayers, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The intimidation and war, my friend, long before we even get our hands dirty, sometimes, my friend, we're just afraid to hit the fight. I've been reading through the book of Deuteronomy in recent weeks and finishing that up, and we spent some time in devotions on our uh, retreat or, or our mission trip where I was sharing in the mornings about different things. And one of the most outstanding things in the past of Scripture, it's really hard to believe that this would actually take place, but they would, the, the priest was to, to go out before the whole army before they were headed out to fight. And the very first words after telling them God's going to fight for you and He's with you, He was to tell them anybody who's afraid to go to war, go on home. That's remarkable to me. Because I'd be thinking, hey, well, well, we need them people. If they're afraid or not, whatever. We, we need a body. But He says, if you're afraid, go home. I wonder, every time they went out for battle, how that thinned the ranks 
of needed bodies on the battlefield. But God saw the weak and the fearful as more, a more of an obstacle for the overall project or pursuit or mission than it was to just send them home. Because, my friend, fear is infectious. Laziness is infectious. Those who opt out of the war and they think you're going crazy because you're trying to keep stuff out of your kids' eyes and you're trying to carry them certain places and keep them from certain places and you prefer the church over the ball field and they think you're nuts for all those kind of things. All I'm saying is you better stay on that battlefield. You better fight when nobody else will fight. The preachers won't fight. You better fight. You better fight for your kids, your grandkids, your family, your marriage. You better get after it. And don't be intimidated. Then there's the inspiration. And I love this aspect. Because in verse number 8, when they're at Jerusalem, David says, who's going up? Who's going to go take this? Who would like to take this city? And whoever takes the city, I'm going to make him, I'm going to make him the ruler. It's so funny because in 2 Samuel 5, it don't tell us who, who went and took the city. Part of that, I think, has to do with David. Even when he mentions his mighty man, he don't even mention Joab. Joab's a bad dude, but we've already read how Joab's been a thorn in David's flesh at times. But you do read. You read about it in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse number 6. It tells us that all Israel went to Jerusalem, and David said, Whosoever smites the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first, and he was chief. Joab went up the water shaft, went into the city, and won Jerusalem for David. He became the leader of the armies. But by the way, when you're reading 1 Chronicles 11, you read not only of Joab taking the city, but the author takes a time where he lists over 30 main mighty men warriors of David. And when you're reading that list, these dudes are doing some bad things. I mean, they're, they're, they're winning battles with, with sticks and they're whipping multiple men at one time. And you're reading, how do these individuals do such extraordinary things? And I'll tell you, there's one reason. Because they'd seen it done in David. Because it wasn't too many years ago, they were all hiding at the giant. They were in their tents and they saw a teenage boy go down there and bring a giant to his knees and remove his head for him because he defied God. And now you find this warrior David who, who's been raised like a giant. And all through these books you're going to read. Where, I mean, Je David was a giant to his people with well, Joab's his nephew. And Joab's like, Uncle David... I mean, to watch your courage and to watch your boldness and to watch God's hand on your life. And Joab said, I'm going to go get me some. And they, he went up there and won Jerusalem. And all those 33 or more men in that chapter, all it's telling us where their faith in their own wars were inspired by the likes of David. So you have this whole army that goes up. It's not just a one-man show. It's not Joab by himself. It's not David by himself. The whole army goes, which, by the way, that's what we need. No man is a lone soldier, right? We're part of an army. God does us benefits to remind us constantly. That's why He constantly places emphasis on the church family. And anybody who doesn't avail themselves of the church family, my friend, listen, you're either ignorant or you're stupid. Right? It can only be one of those two things. Either you're ignorant of the fact that God says we're to constantly be gathering together to be functioning as a church body and exercising our gift and receiving and giving among a church body as the army of God, or we're just so stupid because we, we might know that and we don't do it. And my friend, to think you got a better plan for your life than God, that's the height of stupidity. And so we need each other. Every civilized uh, country on the planet has an army. And, and they got law enforcement, right? Because it's not just about gaining the ground. Now you got to keep the ground. And all this stuff we heard over the past several years about defund the police and all, that's a bunch of bunk. Isn't it amazing? Y'all been seeing on the news the very ones that push that. Now, then they get mugged on the streets and now they want it to a high level again. It's always easy when the bad's happening to you and it ain't happening to me. But this is, it's a common sense thing in society. I'm talking about 
police run rogue. I'm talking about still accountable to people and, and, and having to keep the people trust and reminding that you work for me, we don't work for you mentality. But the reality is you're going to have to have an army. You're going to have to have some, some law enforcement if you're going to have good society, stable society. And God's trying to tell us the same thing in our own battles. We need each other. We are to be interdependent. It's wonderful when you hear people say, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your examples. Thank you for being a part of my life through my own struggles. It's a powerful thing. And so here David has been kind of a catalyst for this, these exercises of faith. His own courage, his own, his own militance has inspired these other people to do extraordinary exploits. Same thing Paul did. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul is in prison. He's writing to the church, right? He's in prison. And, and, and he says, hey, don't feel sorry for me. In other words, he says, don't feel sorry for me in my prison. Here's why. Because of my bonds, many have waxed confident in the faith. He says, they look, what's the worst thing that can happen? You can take a beat and go to prison. And Paul said, I did that. And the people say, you know what? Oh, Paul, if Paul can struggle and if Paul can courageously face the chains and the whip, if Paul can go through that, hey, I'm going to get bare-chested too. I ain't going to back up. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to preach Jesus no matter what happens to me. And Paul's loving every minute of it. He said, if my exploits with Christ can breed confidence in others and inspire others, it's worth it. That brings us to a powerful point. See, we want to see our kids strong. Don't you want to see your kids strong? Don't you want to see them in the face of lures to drugs or lures to immorality and lures of the bully? And don't, don't you want to have your kids that when they have all these things plaguing their heart and mind and they feel overwhelmed in life, don't you want to know, don't you want them to know how to fight? So they don't just give up and give in and go along? See, one of the best things you can do for them is you can fight yourself. Here's, David inspired all these giant killers because they saw how David dealt with his foes. And what I find is too often people are fighting each other instead of fighting the real foe. And your kids need to see you fight. Kids need to see, how's daddy deal with it when he loses his job? How's mama deal with it when she loses her health? Does she fall to pieces? Does he fall to pieces like the rest of the world? Or do they behold something that's not normal to the common world? Do they see them on their knees, praying, fasting, pleading with God, walking with some confidence and joy, not deflated, not defeated, confidence that God will show up? they got to see you fight. The struggle's there. We all know the struggles. Your kids need to see, how do you deal with this crisis? How you deal with the crisis that come to life? How you deal? I'm telling you what, your kids, sometimes I hear people say, well, we, we're splitting up because we don't want the kids to see us fight. Why? Kids ought to see a good fight. I'm not talking about physical type of... But children ought to see conflict. Why? Conflict's a part of life. And they ought to be able to see them. The mom and the daddy who brought them in the world, when there's conflict, they ought to see them, be able to resolve that thing. However, we got to get with the truth. we got to get in prayer. we got to get humbled. we got to do whatever to make this thing work. And you send a sermon to your kids. Here's how you handle conflict when you face it. we got to show our kids how to fight. we got to... We, we can't expect great giants when we're going to be wimps. Tennessee produced a, what many would recognize as a great president of the United States, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was before he was president, he was a General Jackson. Led troops in the War of 1812 and other exploits. He earned the nickname because of his grit, Old Hickory. And that's actually, they gave him that nickname. I think he walked like 512 miles on foot while he let uh, weak bodies rest on his horse. He walked. He earned that reputation, Old Hickory, just firm, strong. He ran on that. He used that in his campaign, got him president because people were wanting something. They were wanting him a rock. They were wanting somebody tough. I love this quote. Here's the way he summarized his life. He says, I was born for the storm. He says, the calm does not suit me. Born for the storm. 
That's why they like David, by the way. When the crown, they put in that crown, they're reminding David how you always led us into battle and you brought home the victory. We need not some kind of legislator that sits up at, at the desk and gives us the order. We want us, we, we got a man now that's king that goes out before us and fights some battles, breeds some courage. Fourthly of all is the relief, the intermissions in war. Verse 9 through 11, just right in the midst of all these wars are these statements. Yet there came along, uh, David dwelt in the city. He built the city bigger, established it. And then um, verse 10, he went on and became greater and God was with him. And then verse 11 tells us how the king of Tyre sends David timber and masons and uh, carpenters and they built David a house. Here David's fight all this. He's been, on, he's been on the run for all these years, living in caves out in the open. And, and then all of a sudden he's king. He's fighting these battles. And in the midst of these battles, sandwiched between Jerusalem and the Philistines, man alive, all of a sudden he starts seeing all this wood show up, all these masonry, all these carpenters, and they built David a house. Here's what the Bible says, verse 11. Uh, verse 12, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and he had exalted his kingdom for his people's sake. David's like, man alive, what a blessing. All that reminds us, my friend, is that everybody ain't always out to get us. In all the battles we got to face with all the people and all the difficulties and all the strains that we deal with in life, there are those times of reprieve. There are the times of refreshment. There's times I'm so thankful to God in my own life. I'm telling you what, ain't no way. You got your own battles you had to fight. I fought my gracious son. Wars. Some of the worst and the darkest have been in churches. But I tell you this, with every scenario through my life of the great battles and the great times of darkness and conflict in my life, every single one of them I can tell you about, there'll be some human being God sent me that refreshed me. Sometimes multiple people. But thank God, my friend, when the whole, seemed like the whole world, if you can just get one voice, one person, seemed like they're in your corner and breathing, man, breathing some life into you. And here David, wall to wall wars, but all along the way, man alive, look how God's blessing him. Look how God's using a king of Tyre to send him blessing and send him times of refreshment. In Psalms 94, the psalmist writes about that. He's in conflict. He's in adversity. And yet in the midst of all that, he says, God, but when I, you give me rest in my contemplations and my thoughts, in the midst of all the horror I'm dealing with, Lord, thoughts of you, let me lay down and have sweet sleep. That's the blessing of having God at work in your life is that the war is real, but my friend, God owns the whole deal. Amen. He owns the whole ball of wax. He can put a stop what He wants to put a stop to. God can deal with the enemy any moment He wants to. God strengthens us all along the way. One of David's famous statements he would quote through all those Psalms. By the way, when you're reading him fighting all these wars, and it just seems like a historical writing, writing on paper, uh, when you read the Psalmist, you read, hey, there's a whole lot of heart and anguish and anxiety going through all them battles. In the midst of it, he says, God... You, you open up my, you give me large places to put my feet in. You take all this stress and you just push it all away and you give me liberty right in the middle of it. The intermissions in the war. Fifth of all, there's the inheritance from the war. Chapter 5, verse 12. Notice Dave's perspective as he speaks from his own heart here. It says, and David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. Wasn't something he was chasing. It was something God put him in. And that he had exalted his kingdom. Here's why. Why would God exalt David? For his people Israel's sake. God exalted David through all these battles. David, is it worth it fighting all these Jebusites, all these Philistines? Oh yeah, it's worth it. Why, David? Because what the, the battles I'm fighting today are the inheritance for somebody else in the future. I mean, he won Jerusalem. To Jerusalem, this is where it happened. All started right here. David takes his city and it becomes the most famous city in all the world of all times. 
There it is, this powerful city that's been taken and destroyed and, and uh, attacked and besieged over and over and over again. But David was securing, listen, he secured a city that he would never see the temple built, but his son would. He'd never see the glory. He would never see, and, and there's no way he could foresee that one day the Lord Jesus Christ Himself will sit in that city on the throne of this world and rule it there for a thousand years of peace. And David is making actions and he's fighting battles that others would inherit the blessings of. That's the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, as it's called. Psalms 87, verse 2 and 3, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. That's Jerusalem. Psalms 137, verse 4 through 6, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the root of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above all my chief joy. And so David was doing like we do, right? We're sitting here in a comfortable situation in, in, in our nation and, and all the benefits and blessings. And I know we like to pick and gripe and all, and there's a lot of problem matter. But my friend, for the most part, we have inherited, we have inherited tremendous blessings from those, whether in uh, 1776, who were fighting for independence of this country from Great Britain's tyranny. Or the, all of the, of the other wars that, that kept us from uh, uh, all one day speaking uh, German under a, a, a tyrannical government, Nazi government, and the many others that have had to deal with us and put their life on the line. And we sit here in the comforts under the shade of sacrifices made because people were willing to fight. If all men are lazy... If all men are so consumed by the latest app on their phone or the show on their television, my friend, there would not be the greatness we enjoy. You mark that down. It took somebody willing to fight and die so we have an inheritance. And then you hear on a regular basis, a man of God or a woman of God afraid to be bold on their job place and definitively stand for Christ because they don't want to get involved. They don't want to make no waves. Who cares if they're all going to hell? At least I'm going to heaven. Everybody's afraid of bold. And all that does, that silence and that intimidation, that fear, it becomes contagious and so it becomes old hat. And so every Christian just thinks that's kind of, well, that's kind of the way we are. Well, at work, we're not, we can't talk about God. You know, in the people in the culture, we can't be bold with our faith. And so we all just cow down and say, I don't want to fight. And people do that with their own families. I'm telling you what, I, I, I'm, uh, I, you've heard me say, before I became a Christian, I fought all the time, inside, outside my home. Every day of my life seemed like it's a fight till I got saved. I've not been in a physical fight since I got saved. Now, Kelly's beat me up a few times, but I didn't have no retaliation to that. That was after I poured syrup in her ear, so I guess I probably deserved it. But here's what I find. I find like people, people kind of walk around a little bit on edge these days. They want to fight about anything and everything instead of the stuff most important worth fighting for. And I'm fighting for the stuff most important. People ain't got much fight in them. I watch on a regular basis. People let, 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 let things go. People fuss in the church about this and that without fight. instead of fighting for the right things, right? Our real common enemy and getting the gospel out and fighting those, in, 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 those things that are obstacles of getting that out and growing people and holding people accountable. Under God, sometimes I feel like when it comes to, to people's marriages or their children, I feel like I'm fighting more for them than they are. I feel like I'm trying to, you know, muster, drive, fire up somebody to, to, to go after and love your kid. And don't let them just go. You can say no. You can put your foot down. You can lead them in the right paths. And fighting for marriage is my friend. That's a sad state in this country. I'm telling you what. We want to leave something behind for our kids and for our church family. We better get to fight. And I don't care what color your hair is. Whether you're dark, gray, or white, don't give up fighting. We need you on the battlefield. 
because there's a lot to be gained. You say, well, I'm almost gone. I ain't got much more I can gain. David's not living for him. He's living for future generations. He's fighting battles. He'll never probably see all of the end results, but he's fighting those battles for the future generations that are to come. Verse 18 through 19, we read of these two stories. I've got five minutes to finish this. Let me summarize it. The intelligence for war is simply this. The Philistines hear David's king. Imagine, they, they, didn't, they didn't, weren't so upset at David when he wasn't the king when he was on the run, but now he's the king. They're coming after him. You stick up your head, you're going to do something for God. Enemy's going to come make it difficult for you. And so the Philistines gather uh, there near Jerusalem. And so David, before he takes a step off the throne, David says, God, I want to find out what you want me to do. Man, that's some wisdom. You don't just run headlong and start fighting anybody and everything. You'd be like Paul. We're just fighting the wind. He stopped and the Bible says, and he inquired of the Lord. He did that the first attack and he beat the Philistines. Later they come back again. And what does David do? He doesn't say, well, God wanted me to go fight him the first time, so I'm just going to go fight him the second time. No, you read in those verses that the Bible says again, and David, verse 23, inquired of the Lord. Two battles, same people, and yet both times he stopped to pray to discern God's will. Good thing he did, by the way, because it was one direction God gave him to attack the Philistines in the first battle. The second battle, he says, I don't want you to attack. I want you to come around, pull back, hang out around them mulberry trees, whatever kind of tree that was. And he says, when you hear that wind, when you, when you hear that going forth in the trees, he says, then you go out and you fight them. And so God gave him two different sets of instructions. And so, my friend, we got to be in tune with God. Every battle, even those, those who have fought it in times past in a certain way, it's not always fought in the same manner. God's got some different methods. He ain't going to change his made. Uh, he's not going to change his message. He's not going to change his tools. But occasionally God's going to change his direction. Sometimes we got to move forward. Sometimes we got to pull back. But always ready for the battle. And so God tells us the same thing. And in the psalmist, when you read in Psalms 4, you find the heart of David where David says, I'm in the middle of this battle. I'm struggling. So what am I going to do? I'm going to call on God and God will hear my prayer. He didn't go into this battle flippantly. He knew the power was won or lost on the knees. I've always taught my children along the way. You, I've raised them and prayed for them. And man alive, uh, poured in all kind of uh, prayer and tears over their life. And, and then as they got older, I started reminding them, listen, I can't do your knee work for you. That's what I tell them. you got to do your own knee work. you got to put in your own prayer time. You got to go to God. You got to seek His face. You got to find His will and discern it for your life. And so, this is exactly what Ephesians 6, right? He tells them we go to warfare, put on the whole armor of God. We know that passage. We're putting on the helmet and the breastplate and the shield and the feet shot with the preparation of the gospel. And he lays out all that armor. Well, we're ready every day to go to war. And then verse 18 wraps it all together and says, But make sure you pray with all prayer and supplication because God moves when people pray. It moves the heart of God. And so prayer is, the, is this instrument to, to find the intelligence of God. Lord, you know this person and you know the situation. You know the fix for it. I don't. And so I'm yielding to you, God, what steps do I take? I'm doing what James 1 says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. When? Well, James 1 was in the midst of the battle, in the midst of trials. When, you, when you're confused and frustrated, call on God and He will give you wisdom in what to do. And by the way, he's given us a whole book of wisdom. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly. We don't need tanks and, and rifles to fight the kind of battle the Christian buys. He said, but our weapons are more powerful. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what those weapons are? The weapons are the Word of God. That's the tool he's talking about. It's exactly what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 18, when he says, This charge I commit to you, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you, that you by them might war a good warfare. And so we need prayer. We need the Word of God to guide our every step. There's the inadequacy of, of war expressed in verse number 12 when it says, And David perceived the Lord had established him. Verse 19, when he prays to God, says, God says, you go out and fight them and I will deliver them in your hand. 
Verse 20, I love uh, where, where he expresses that in verse 20. First Chronicles amplifies that aspect when he says, he says, God was like this flood. He, he names the place where he beat those Philistines, this breach where God like burst the dam. And David said, I watched those Philistines, I watched those Philistines die like a flood sweeping them away, God's hand. And he said, God did it by my hand. What David's reminding us is he, we're constantly reminded, we, we ain't got no power. I have no ability. I am no match for the devil. I'm no match for this world. But I am connected to the one who has all power, all wisdom, and is everywhere. And David says, God did it by my hand. In fact, verse number 24, I, I love this. God says, here's what you want to do. Go buy them mulberry trees. Them old preachers used to love preaching on them mulberry trees. I heard so many of them old preachers, man, they love preaching this text. They like talking about that, that going in the mulberry trees. Well, the going in the mulberry trees was God Himself. He says, that's when you're going to know when to go, is when you see that going forth in the mulberry trees, God says, I'm going to go out before you and I'm going to fight your enemies. All you got to do is come and clean up. And this is where God puts us. He puts us in the place of His presence. He reminds us that He goes ahead of us. I fought many a battle in my life, and my friend, it ain't over. I got a lot of wars to fight, a lot of battles. Lord, give me breath of life. There's some more battles for me and you both. What are you going to do? Because you just got those on the front lines marching forward, knowing I got a fight or just casualties laying on the battlefield. And by the way, when you're casualty, now all that's made more work for somebody else. Come along, take care of you, get you back on the battlefield. We got a war to fight. A real war, real battle, real consequences, real lives at stake, souls at stake in life and for eternity. God, help us not to be lazy. God, let us not to get settled in what we're doing. Help us to realize life is every day a call to put on my camo, strap up my boots, put on my armor, and go to war and join Christ in this battle that's been going on since Genesis 3.15. Let's bow for prayer. If you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ, that's what you need. You need Him as your Savior. You need Him as your Lord. And, and you can have that if you'll repent from your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's the leader. He's not the follower. He's the leader. He's the captain of our salvation. God is building not only a family but an army to be salt and light in this world that's crooked and to fight some battles that will help us and build us and give us as it did David, give us a name, a name that's attached to God's name, with the powerful and the incredible and the, the, the testimony of God's glory. War has a purpose. And God's got a purpose in it all. And it's through the struggle, it's through the war, and it's through the battle that God builds us as men and glorifies His name through it all. And one day, that battle's going to be over for good. Jesus already fought the greatest battle on the cross. He won it. He freed us from sin and from hell. And one day in heaven, my friend, all the battles will come to a conclusion. And the peace and the rest of heaven. But until you get there, God help His people tonight be on the front lines and ready to fight. God, we love you tonight and thank you for your holy word. I ask you by your Holy Spirit, God, you'd speak to our own lives and stir our own, our own souls, Lord, with the truth, the same truth that was born in David and moved David and fueled his faith. Help us find to find not the battles of curious things or a surprise or something, God, that uh, is uncommon, but let us embrace it. Give us a little bit of the the grit of Andrew Jackson. Help us to know we're born for the storm. And Lord, help us to be ready to, in your name, walk with you through it. Claiming our families, our children, our marriages, and the souls of men and women in this church body for the honor and glory of your name. For it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.